You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. So it turns out Bavarian is more than just a great cheesecake. In fact, it's this place in Europe. It has princes. Princes who are actually quite talented when it comes to uh, fighting wars. So, who were these princes? How did they fight in a unified Germany? And what is their story? G'day listeners and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast. Thanks very much for all the iTunes reviews we've had of late, especially uh, that uh, three-star one in the US that doesn't like my jokes. Uh, there's an answer for that. Um, yeah, just don't listen. Or give us five stars and still don't listen. But uh, for the rest of you, thanks very much for the reviews. I suppose I can't be too upset about uh, getting iTunes reviews, even if they are uh, three stars and don't like my jokes. Not that I take it personally. Now, today we're going to talk about the First World War. And uh, for all those Americans, that's World War I. And we're going to talk about an individual in that war who uh, isn't always recognised uh, by a lot of the... I will say, the English-speaking side of that war, and I suppose the the French-speaking side of that war, although they had quite an experience of him. Um, But I actually don't know too much about uh, old Roops, and uh, that's what I'm going to call him, old Roops, or Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria is probably uh, what most people know him as. But I need an expert to tell me about it. And luckily, someone has just written a book about Crown Prince Ruprecht, and that is Jonathan Bock. He's a senior lecturer in history and war studies at the University of Birmingham, where he teaches courses on conflict from Homer to Helmand. And Homer being my favourite uh, TV character, and Helmand being a place I spent a nice winter. He specialises in the First World War and his previous book, Winning and Losing on the Western Front, the British Third Army and the Defeat of Germany in 1918, was published in 2012 by Cambridge University Press. It was shortlisted for the Templar Medal and for the British Army Book of the Year. He was educated at Merton College, Oxford. Now, that's a, uh, that's a school in uh, London. It's all right from uh, all reputation. And the Department of War Studies, King's College, London, another school you may or may not have heard of. He spent 20 years working in finance before returning to academia. He serves on the councils of the National Army Museum and Army Record Society. And he has worked as a historical consultant with the British Army and the BBC. And finally, he is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And most importantly to us, he is the author of a book on Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria. It is called Haig's Enemy. Jonathan, thanks for appearing on the show. Mick, thank you very much indeed for having me. Much appreciate the time. Now, Jonathan, before we get into the details uh, today of uh, Crown Prince Rubrecht and his role in the First World War in uh, fighting for the Imperial German Army and uh, keeping the English uh, at bay, I suppose, or even being uh, being the person uh, on the offensive, I'm keen to know, as I'm sure some of my listeners are, how you found yourself in, in as a... Hist- I'm keen to know how you wound up as a historian, given that it seems he had a bit of a circuitous route. <laughs> yes, that's about right. Well, uh, when I left university, I had such a big overdraft that the chances of pursuing an academic career or anything like it were, were slim to none. Um, and so what I um, did, I went off and worked in, in finance for about 20 years, in uh, mainly in Asia, in fact, a lot of it in Japan. Um, and then I got to about 40 and, you know, typical midlife crisis. I, I suppose I sat there, woke up one morning and I thought, what am I going to do? Am I going to run off and buy a Harley or should I do something a bit more useful in my life? And so I went back to school, uh, finished my education and uh, did a PhD and, uh, and, and got a job here at the University of Birmingham where I've been teaching history for about eight years now. Wow, that's quite an interesting journey. Yeah, well, I had a lot of fun out of my previous career, uh, but I suppose you know, there'd always been a little, a little bit of me that had wondered uh, about writing history books and, and teaching history as a profession, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was time to get on and do something about it and stop talking about it, and uh, so that's what I decided to do. Well, luckily today, you get a chance to talk about it, because our topic is actually based on your latest project, which was a book called Haig's Enemy. 
Now, this focuses on Crown Prince Ruprecht of uh, Bavaria and uh, Germany's war on the Western Front. Why did you choose to look into this particular individual in the First World War? Well, I think there's three, there's three main reasons, Mick. Um, the first, sort of quickest answer to it is that so far as the British, and by British I'm including the Australians and the Canadians and the Kiwis, uh, of course, so far as the British were concerned, uh, he was by far the most important general on the German side. Right the way from October 1914 all the way through to the end of the war, every battle that the, the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, fought, Ruprecht was always the general on the German side. So he was the direct counterpart of both of the two main British commanders-in-chief, both Sir John French uh, and Sir Douglas Haig. And although you know, the rivalry between Ruprecht and Haig was never as intense or as public as, say, that between Rommel and Montgomery uh, in the Second World War, nonetheless, in a sense, in a very real sense, uh, Haig was, uh, Ruprecht, I beg your pardon, was Haig's enemy. So, so he's a very important figure, but yet nobody has ever written a book about him as a general, and certainly not in English. The second and slightly longer bit of the answer, I guess, is that a lot of the time, especially in the Commonwealth, we tend to view the First World War almost entirely through the British perspective. But obviously, this was a war with, this was a war with two sides. Uh, and to see the... And when we, when we look at the First World War through German eyes, it gives us a chance to look at it, I think, in, in a whole new light. And following Ruprecht, because he's so important for the war effort, the whole way through the war gives us a really good chance to do that and to look at what we think we know, you know, in some new and exciting ways. And, and the third reason is that he's an interesting chap. He was an interesting chap in his own right. Uh, most of the First World War generals, as any of you who, who, who've listened, uh, who've looked at them know, are, are pretty dull characters, really. They, they fight, but maybe they play a bit of golf. They, they're probably interested in horses, and that's kind of it. Well, this guy has got a real hinterland. Uh, he's a very cultured man, really interested in art, uh, in travel, and in some ways he lived a, a rather tragic life. Um, so what I wanted to do was to, to, to look a little bit to see you know, what people like him, or he and people like him, were they just sort of aristocrats and royalty that were sort of washed away by this tide of modernity in the first half of the 20th century? Or... Did the mistakes that they made contribute to their own downfall? Hmm. And uh, I suppose uh, focusing on um, just for a moment uh, how you, you you referred to uh, Sir General Douglas Haig and uh, you know the yep. title of the book uh, focusing old groups uh, frames him in terms of um, in Haig's enemy as Haig's enemy. So uh, looking more deeply at that, um, uh, for our listeners uh, who may or may not know who Sir Douglas Haig is, um, why, is mm. it, why is it that uh, Roops was uh, specifically Haig's enemy? What sort of, uh, you know, were there quite famous battles that uh, they were on uh, the opposing side sure. quite directly for? Or? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Well, uh, basically Ruprecht, before the war, he was 45 when the war broke out in 1914. He... He pursued a life as a sort of typical royal prince uh, with all the uh, privileges uh, that entails, uh, basically being a playboy around Europe until about 1900. Then he got married, he settled down, and he started to buckle down to a military career and, and became, you know, certainly by the standards of royal princes anyway, a pretty serious soldier. You know, he took his career pretty, pretty seriously before the war. So when war came, he was already designated to be the commander of one of the uh, seven German armies that were going to operate on the Western Front. Uh, and so he marched off to war in August 1914, spent the first couple of months fighting against the French, actually, yeah. uh, in, on, on the left wing of the, of the German attack. Um, and then when the uh, war there became stalemated, he got transferred north, and that's when he comes up against the British uh, for the first time. So he's the German commander uh, in a lot of the iconic battles that I'm sure many of your listeners will have heard about, like, uh, for instance, the First Battle of Ypres in the end yep. of 1914, uh, the Battle of the Somme in 1916, yep. the Battle of Arras in 1917, when the Australians have a, have a horror show at Bulacore, yeah. uh, <clears throat> Third Ypres, when the Australians and the Kiwis both get a hiding 
uh, or get into a lot of trouble, I should say, yeah. uh, as they're fighting towards Passchendaele. Um, all these battles, and then in the spring of 1918, it's his armies that launched the big German offensives that are designed to win the war in March 1918, the so-called Kaiser's Battle. Yeah. Uh, and then again, when the Allies go on the counteroffensive for the last three months of the war, uh, it's his men that are trying to stop them. So every time the British turn around, it's always Ruprecht and his boys uh, who are in the way. Hmm. Sounds like uh, like quite a place to be. It sounds like he's at the uh, hub of all the action at the time. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, he 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 clearly, <clears throat> you know, although he wasn't a a twenty four seven professional general like some of the other German generals of this time, he he was after all a royal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, he he clearly was an, an able commander. Uh, he was promoted halfway through the war to field marshal. He was given, so he started off as an army commander. Mm. Half, halfway through the war, he's made a field marshal. He's given command of an army group. You know, he's commanding uh, a million, million and a half men. This is not small beer by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, small Bavarian beer, uh, as would have it. <laughs> now, um, talking about uh, that particular um, uh, pint of beer, the uh, the Imperial German Army, and... Uh, and mm. And the men that uh, Ruprecht was in charge of. Uh, what was the state of the army at the time, uh, and yeah. you know, what what were the challenges for the uh, the German army, particularly the army commanded by Ruprecht? Sure. Well, it's just worth, probably just worth explaining a little bit. Under the the constitution of the German Empire, um, which is what's in place when they all go to war in the First World War. The Kaiser is, the, is top dog, right? He's the emperor, yeah. and he's also the king of Prussia, which is the largest state within Germany. Bavaria is the second biggest state yeah. uh, within Germany. It's, it's a, the area around Munich where BMW cars come from uh, today. Um, that's the second biggest state, and that's the royal family that Ruprecht is a member of. His father he becomes king in 1913, and that's how Ruprecht becomes crown prince. Yeah. Now, in peacetime, each of these individual kingdoms within Germany has their own army. They're all set up along the same lines as the German army, uh, however, and when war comes, the Kaiser automatically becomes supreme warlord of the whole shooting match. Mm -hmm. So all the, so the Bavarian army effectively becomes part of the German army. Yep. There, are, there are analogies here, actually, in the relationship between Bavaria and Prussia or Bavaria and Germany and, say, Australia and Britain, because although they are you know, functionally the same, yeah. there are political, political sensitivities, of course, that have to be weighed uh, at various points between Britain and Australia or between you know, Prussia and Bavaria. So, so one of you know, Ruprecht's jobs is to balance these sort of nationalist agendas, uh, if you like. Anyway, but once the war starts, they more or less, for functional purposes, become pretty much interchangeable. And, and indeed, after not very long, German, Prussian units are being swapped with uh, Bavarian units or Saxon units or all the, different independent, all the different independent states. The thing that I think is really interesting about looking at, at the German army really closely on the, in the Western Front is that I think when you do so, as I've tried to, to argue in this book, what you find out is that all the sort of myths that we have stuck in our brain about how the German army is the best army in the world in the first half of the 20th century, at least in a technical, you know, a tactical sense, although obviously the political and the strategic purposes that it's put to are, are well, horrendous. Yeah. Uh, but in, but in, in terms of what it actually can do on the battlefield, I think most of us would probably think automatically that this is, this is the nuts. <clears throat> but actually, it isn't. Yeah. Uh, that the all the things that are held up as making it a model of, of military efficiency in terms of uh, a, a merit, very meritocratic command system, a very decentralized, flexible command system, uh, Auftrag's tactic, we call it mission command today, yeah. all these sorts of things that we assume are taking place uh, within the German army, the, its ability to innovate, to develop uh, stormtroop tactics, defense in depth, all the sort of fundamentals of modern uh, battlefield tactics, actually, yeah. for, heavy, for heavy metal warfare anyway, uh, all these things that look like strengths are actually hiding deep weaknesses in the German system. Okay. So the, the officer corps is completely riven with cliques and patronage and 
there's not much meritocracy about it uh, at all, in, yep. in my opinion. Um, senior commanders aren't allowing the man on the spot to get on and make the decisions that he needs to do, as mission command would suggest. They're interfering in what they do the whole blooming time. Uh, you know, at various points, Ludendorff, who is in charge of all the German armies from Belgium to the Ukraine, so you know the whole of Europe, yeah. it, it, it is picking apart the deployment of individual anti-tank gun batteries of, <laughs> that various divisions are deploying on the Western Front. I mean, it's nuts. He must have been a busy man. He was a very busy man. Well, no one can do that, right? No one, no one. However, however much of a genius you are, no one can manage that level of detail and, and keep all those balls in the air. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to innovation and tactical development and all these kinds of things, actually the Germans lost that race. It was the British and the French and eventually the Americans uh, who managed to out-innovate the Germans and that helped them win the war. So, so this whole idea that the, the Germans, you know, the Germans are at a strategic disadvantage yeah. because they're relatively small, they've got relatively small numbers, they're, they're isolated in the middle of Europe, they haven't got control of the seas, all these kinds of things. Uh, that's all in, in the sort of common perception. That's offset by how good the German army is. Well, I just don't think that's true, actually. I mean, I think you know the the the, the German army starts the war stronger probably than its allies, but by the middle or certainly by the end, it's really really starting to lose the plot. Hmm. And 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 we come to the end um, of the war, and, and you know, not just losing the plot, losing the war. Uh, but losing yep. the war for Ruprecht, um, as I suppose with most, actually I don't suppose, I know, uh, with most Europeans <laughs> at the time, was quite a tragedy. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about the personal losses uh, suffered by the good prince? Sure. Well, as I said earlier, I mean, he, he had a tragic life before the war even started. He, mm. His first wife married, uh, they married, died very young. Yeah. They had five children together, only one of whom um, reached adulthood. Um, but then come the end of the war, 1918, there are revolutions throughout Germany. The Kaiser gets kicked out. Yep. Uh, uh, obviously, the Emperor of Austria gets kicked out. The Emperor of Russia is already gone. The Ottoman Empire uh, is dismantled. But within the German Revolution, most or all of the royal families of all the subsidiary states get kicked out too. Yep. So on the 9th of November, 1918, a couple of days before the end of the war, Ruprecht's father, uh, Runs away. There's a coup in Munich, uh, and uh, and King King Ludwig is his name. Yep. Uh, he does a runner. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden, Ruprecht is, you know, having gone from being this crown prince in charge of an army group, he's now got no army group and no throne to inherit <clears throat> uh, either. Bugger. He'd he'd just been about to, yeah exactly. He'd just been about to to remarry. Not unsurprisingly, that gets put on hold. Yeah. Uh, for a bit. He's in exile for about a year. He, he, he escapes over the border from Belgium into Holland uh, and, and lives there in hiding for a little while until it's safe for him to go back to Bavaria. Not unreasonably, given you know, that the Tsar had only been, just been murdered by the, by the Bolsheviks. Yep. He's a bit worried that something similar might happen to him. Yeah. So, but anyway, eventually he gets back, to, um, gets back to Bavaria and settles down a, 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 into a sort of king without a crown kind of a life. So he's going around opening, you know, village fates and yeah. uh, launching ships and laying foundation stones, you know, all the kind of sort of royal duties that people do, although he isn't actually the king or, or, or even the crown prince. Yeah. He, he'd also quite like to be made king again, uh, but, it, but he's not, he wants it to happen constitutionally. Yeah. Uh, so he's not prepared to sort of take the, initi take the initiative. He's, he's waiting for someone to come along and say, why don't you become king again? Yeah. Ideally, for everyone to come at once and say, why don't you become king again? Um, <clears throat> but there's a couple of obstacles to that. And, and the first one crops up in, in 1923. He has some conversations with some right-wingers in Munich, home of the Nazi party, yeah. including one Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> about the possibility of them helping him get back on the throne. Now, Ruprecht and Hitler are chalk and cheese. You know, you've got yeah. this very aristocratic, well, royal uh, prince and this, com as far as Ruprecht would have been concerned, this common little ex-corporal. Yep. Uh, you know, they had very little in common. I don't think they, was, I don't think they were ever going to be able to work together very well. Yeah. But in 1923, Hitler tries to launch a coup in Munich to seize control of Munich, and then he's going to march on Berlin. That's his idea. And it fails. 
the man standing next to, to Hitler is shot and killed. Unfortunately, of course, Hitler survives. Yeah. Uh, but he is arrested and he's banged up in jail uh, for a while. And he always blames Ruprecht for the failure of this coup. Now, to what extent that's true, I guess, frankly, the evidence is going to, you know, we're never going to know because the evidence just doesn't exist any longer. Yeah. My guess is that Rupert had some level of knowledge about it, but probably didn't know the details and the specifics. But that's just a guess. Yeah. Anyway, none of this matters very much because Hitler's in jail. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it does start to matter in, after 1933 when Hitler comes to power yeah. uh, in Germany. And you know, Hitler bears grudges easily. We know that. Just a few. Doesn't like, yeah, doesn't like Ruprecht. Um, there's also a little bit of... Um, what's the word, political maneuvering uh, to try and give Ruprecht a sort of, you know, again, a, a sort of king role in Bavaria to, 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 to fend off, you know, the, the sort of reach of the Nazis from Berlin yeah. uh, back into Bavaria, sort of, you know, to, to create some local prestige and so on uh, in 1933. That, that doesn't go anywhere. Um, but so, so Ruprecht's a bit vulnerable, really, and, and he goes into a kind of internal exile. He keeps a very low profile um, uh, under the first years of the Nazis. Um, and then when the war breaks out in 1939, it's obviously just, you know, Germany has become a much more dangerous place for people who Hitler doesn't like. Yeah. So, so Ruprecht uh, goes into exile in Italy, uh, where he's protected by the Pope and by the King of Italy. So he's all right for a bit until, of course, the war then comes to Italy yeah. um, in 1943, 1944. Ruprecht's living in Florence. Uh, after D-Day and the fall of Rome, and particularly after the um, plot to kill Hitler in July 1944, when the regime lash, starts lashing out at anybody that they, they fancy, the Gestapo come looking for Ruprecht. Uh, but, but luckily for him, he's already been warned, uh, and he goes into hiding uh, in Florence. Yeah. Uh, but his family are picked up, uh, his, uh, all his children uh, and his wife, um, are all banged up in concentration camps for, from sort of July 1944 through until they're eventually liberated by the Americans in, uh, in April of 1945 with the collapse of the Third Reich. Uh, and his wife very nearly dies. She, she weighs less than 40 kilograms uh, when she comes out of this, uh, this wow. concentration camp and, and refuses actually ever to live in Germany uh, again uh, as a result. Ruprecht does go back to Germany. Their marriage is more or less broken down by this stage. Um, he, he does go back to Germany uh, and survives there until 1955. He's, he eventually dies at the age of uh, 86. But obviously, after the war, uh, he, he's got much less of a role to play. He's getting a bit too old, uh, uh, frankly. Yeah, and yeah, it's, uh, I think uh, by that time, uh, Europe was well shot of uh, any yeah. form of autocratic rule. Um, now, did he? Right. Did, now, you said he had, uh, you know, he's one surviving child from his first uh, marriage. Um, That's right. Mm hmm. Uh, was was that his son that um, didn't survive the war? Is that correct? No, his son. All his children did did actually survive. They did. Okay. Uh, and the and, and the so so he was succeeded. There there is still his grandson. So his son's son is still. They, they call him the Duke of Bavaria, but he still lives in some of the ancestral palaces in Munich. He's just uh, waiting for that constitutional reform, isn't he? He's just waiting for that constitutional reform. He's uh. He's now in his 80s as well. I've corresponded with him, but unfortunately I haven't been uh, able to meet him. Uh, maybe, maybe when I send him a copy of the book, he might. Who knows? Um, yeah, that's right. He's just after freebie. Uh, so, yeah, that's right. So there is, a, yeah, there is still a royal family in, in Bavaria. Like I said, they're, they're, not, they're not called the kings anymore, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but they're still around. Um, and, uh, and he did help me with my research, in fairness. Oh, it's, uh, it, it's quite, it sounds like quite a yarn. Uh, and, you know, uh, I guess... Uh, one of the bonuses that um, Ruprecht outlasted Hitler by, um, you know, over a decade. So that's that's quite good. Um, yep. But uh, we could probably spend a fair bit of time on it, but we actually want people to buy your book as well. So we're probably going to um, move on to the final question, which uh, hopefully you have a good answer for, because you've had at least 18 months to prepare for it since I started um, focusing on your little project here and trying to get you on. Um, so each guest is finished asked to finish the sentence, war is. Now, this is because of uh, our mission on the dead Prussian. Note, it's not the dead uh, Bavarian, uh, ladies and gents. Maybe I missed <laughs> my calling there. Um, but our mission is very similar to that of Big Carl, the original dead Prussian, not the first Prussian to ever die. But, um, well, you know what I mean, people. Um, our understanding of war is framed by how we define it. 
uh, and therefore um, I invite you to offer a definition, uh, continue to engage in uh, the debate, a debate in which you're uh, quite active in. Um, can you please finish the sentence, war is? Oh, this is a difficult one, even when you know it's been coming for a while. Yeah. Uh, I think the best I can do is that war is a lousy way of deciding arguments, but we haven't thought of a better one yet. That's, that's a good one. It's very, uh, very uh, Churchill-esque, uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, that's, that's a good one. It actually um, fits in line. With, I'm noticing a theme this year. Uh, the 2018 theme seems to be very close to that. You know, we've had uh, war is avoidable, suffering, um, and, and war is a terrible is a terrible way. In, sorry, war is an incomplete way to solve political problems. It's been another yep. one. Yeah. Um, so we've been getting some good ones. So that's a, that's quite good, a, a, a lousy way to solve a problem. That's good. That's my uh, summary of your uh, definition. Look, Jonathan, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's uh, been great to have you on. And thank you for letting me pester you for the, the good part of 18 months uh, once I found out that uh, someone was researching uh, old Ruprecht. And it was almost around the same time that I was uh, studying um, the First World War. So uh, if you noticed why my uh, messages were quite... Uh, Pertinent back then, I was probably uh, looking for an essay, uh, inroad and insight that no one else had. But thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much indeed, Mick. It's been a great pleasure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can find Jonathan's book through our show notes uh, at uh, the podcast app that you use or go to our website on the episodes page and you can click the hyperlink uh, to Jonathan's book in the description of the episode. Uh, and it's called Hague's Enemy. And if you get it through uh, the link we provide, it uh, will come via Book Depository, which, of course, offers a free global shipping anywhere in the world. Uh, thanks very much for your support on iTunes, as I said before, uh, rather glibly, but all support on iTunes is appreciated. Also, a uh, big shout-out to our legends, the uh, TDP community members who subscribe through uh, Patreon. Hopefully, you're enjoying all the bonus content you get. Uh, but until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution license. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.